I'm Margaret Bowden. I'm research professor of cognitive science at the University of Sussex. And uh, what I do is try and think about how the mind works, what it is that the brain is doing. Um, and I try to think about those issues in computational terms, uh, not in the sense of writing programs or writing computer models, but in the sense of thinking about what the psychological processes are, or might be, you know, with the help of ideas drawn from artificial intelligence. I suppose I draw inspiration from all areas of AI that, uh, that tend to be interesting in terms of the questions which really motivate me, and those are questions about the human mind, not about computers about the human, well, for that matter, animal minds too, but I'm most interested in the human mind. Um, and uh, so, for example, one of the things that's interested me for many, many years is creativity. Creativity in art, in science, and in, you know, everyday conversations in railway carriages. Um, because we all have creativity, it's not just a few people who have it. Um, and I think not only that... Um, Creativity certainly isn't a mystery, you know, sort of some sort of God-given, uh, unintelligible marvel. It is a marvel. Um, it is a mystery, if you like, in the sense we don't understand it very well yet. Um, but it's certainly not magic. And I think that if you think about creativity in computational terms, it can get you a long way to seeing, you know, what was being done in the various examples of creativity that we see all around us. For my interest, neuro-inspired AI um, isn't actually very interesting or very helpful because um, at the moment I think neuroscience um, can only help us to understand uh, how associative memories work. And even in that case, um, you know, they can't go very far. I mean, for example, if you want to understand how somebody might connect two familiar ideas in a new and unfamiliar way, um, I mean, to some extent it helps to understand how the neurons might be working and, and so on. Um, so there are ideas that help, but it isn't just a question of making associations, it's a question of sorting out the ones that are relevant and deep and insightful from the others that are just new. And that is something about which current neuroscience has absolutely nothing to say. And if you go to other sorts of creativity, which don't depend just on unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas, um, which, but which depend on the exploration and sometimes even the transformation of current styles of thinking, whether it's styles of painting or uh, areas of chemistry, whatever it is, um, there again there are um, questions about the structure of the thinking which uh, current neuroscience can't even begin to help us to think about. So at the moment um, it isn't particularly helpful. Well, I mean, yeah, if it progresses in, in the relevant ways, yes. And of course AI has all, already been inspired by it. And in fact, I mean, um, philosophers were in, inspired by ideas about how the brain might be working way back in the 18th century. And, uh, you know, even when AI started, just as many people really were thinking about what we would now call connectionist uh, methods as we're thinking about symbolic methods. And of course, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a sudden um, spurt in AI in those sorts of systems, um, for various reasons, which were all broadly inspired by the brain, obviously. But of course, very different too, because Batprop, for instance, um, uh, is a thoroughly sort of non-biological, non-neuroscientific idea, not least because in Batprop, in the connections, um, messages, information can pass both ways, whereas in a synapse it only works one in one direction. And also, of course, the computational units that current AI can cope with in connectionist um, models are 
hugely simple compared with even a single neuron. Um, so inspiration is, is, is one thing, and it's important, and it's happened, and it will continue to happen, um, but inspiration can be at a, a very, very broad level. And to say that um, A is inspired by B does not mean that A is anything like a sort of good model or analogy of B. It's inspired by it, has something in common, but it may have very little in common. Well, of course, we understand the um, sort of primary areas dealing with particularly vision, but also um, hearing and to some degree smell, better than we do, much, much better than we do the cerebral cortex, which is where arguably most of the more interesting stuff goes on. Um, and so obviously what one would hope uh, from neuroscience is that it will throw light on what's going on there um, as well as what's going on in, for example, primary visual cortex, which we understand you know, very well. Um, but I think it's going to be a two-way movement here because the neuroscientists aren't going to find out the answer to these questions unless they ask the right questions. And the right questions are going to concern, you know, the sorts of computations which the brain must be somehow performing in order that certain types of behaviour might arise. And, for example, I mean, a lot of uh, human behaviour um, is hierarchical. And, um, as we know from, from AI, um, one of the things that symbolic AI was very, very good at doing was modelling hierarchical thinking. It's something which connectionism is very, very poor at. I mean, despite you know, valiant efforts by people like Gelman and, and so on and Hinton and so on, um, the degree to which connectionism at present uh, can model hierarchy is very, very limited. And, um, and therefore, to say that well, sorry, obviously at some level the brain is a connectionist system, clearly. So clearly I'm not saying that a connectionist uh, system, in the general sense, including actual biological connectionist systems, can't do hierarchy. I mean, we do hierarchy, we are basically connectionist systems in a certain sense. But the, the, the problem is, A, to understand, I mean, just to take this example, the problem is, A, to understand just what hierarchical... Um, thought systems we are actually using and what sorts of computations we are performing over them in manipulating them and exploring them and, and, and so forth and B, how it is possible um, for a connectionist system whether it's a biological one that the neuroscientists are studying or whether it's an AI one um, how it is possible for that type of system to implement those types of computation. Now, the neuroscience is never going to get a, an answer to that question unless they ask it, and they're not going to ask that question until they look at ideas from psychology, from AI, uh, from wherever they can get them, if you like, but psychology and AI, um, about these sorts of issues, which at the moment they just don't, because they know they can't get anywhere with them, I'm not suggesting. Um, but similarly, once they had found out something about how such things might be implemented in the brain, then I would think it's very likely that their ideas might then feed back into, uh, on the one hand, theoretical psychology, on the other hand, a AI. So I think it's a two-way street here. But at the moment, um, there's, there's, at that level, there's hardly any um, exchange of ideas. Um, but if we're now, I'm talking about the um, you know the cerebral hemispheres. That I mean, I'm not a neuroscientist. I can't you know reel off a list of names of the different parts of the brain and so on and so forth. And uh, what I'm saying is that uh, we even at the level of correlations, we don't know very much yet. Although brain imaging, you know, brain scanning, they're attempting to to find out. But even if you find a correlation between activity in a particular part of the brain right, and a particular 
um, psychological event, right? Even if you find such a thing, at the moment um, you don't know uh, even whether it's excitatory or inhibitory neurons that you're looking at. I mean, all you know is there's activity, there's blood, flow, you know, increased blood flow, or whatever it is, in this particular part of the brain. I mean, as w as um, techniques for uh, monitoring either single neurons or small groups of neurons um, individually, so to speak, um, in the living human being uh, progress. Now, at the moment, this can only be done in, in, in patients that were undergoing a certain sorts of brain surgery. Otherwise, obviously, you can't do it. Um, but, I mean, as those sorts of techniques progress, um, if they do, um, we'll be in a much better situation, or well, the neuroscientists will be in a much better situation you know, to start asking these questions. At the moment, all they've got is um, very, very um, unsystematic and ill-understood correlations. And we need more than that, we need theory, we need to understand the computational structure of the thinking that's going on. And we need neuroscience, which is um, guided by our theories about what types of um, computation are going on. And at the moment, there's very, very, very little of that. There is some. I mean, Chris Frith, for example, um, who is one of the pioneer brain scanners, is um, one of those very rare people <laughs> who actually do um, do brain scanning, which is guided by particular um, uh, psychological theories. I mean, for instance, it's not the only instance, but for instance, um, his work on um, autism and theory of mind, um, where he's he's looked at specific areas in the brain in his brain scanning um, experiments. Uh, picked those areas um, because of specific psychological theories about what causes autism, and he's found some very, very interesting results. Uh, but, but as I say, that's very unusual, and we need more of that. But of course, in order to have more of that, we don't just need scientists to be more willing to listen to the psychologists, we need the psychologists to do their job better. Because it's no good asking the neuroscientists to go away and pick up the psychological theories, because there aren't very many psychological theories that ask these sorts of questions either. There are too many psychological theories, well, not theories, too much um, psychological work, in my view, is if you like, uh, in a way, well, it's sort of looking for correlations, it's looking for, not correlations, obviously, between the brain and other things, but looking for patterns in behaviour and predictable patterns in behaviour, but not asking really deep questions about the sorts of computation that might underlie them. And that's what we need in order to start asking f uh, more fruitful neuroscientific questions, I think. Um, Uh, by the way, uh, when I say computational working of psychology, I don't mean computer... I'm not saying that psychologists should uh, necessarily uh, write computer uh, models or you know, be part of a team that writes computer models. I mean, some do, and that's fine if you can do it. I think that's great. I think it's a very, very good discipline and teaches you a lot. Um, but but n not asking for that, um, I'm asking that they think computationally, that they think about... Uh, you know, what sorts of conversation could um, result in the sorts of behavioural pattern that they see. And if you ask for an example, well, I'll um, give you one coming from the example I already gave you um, uh, of Chris Frith's work in neuroscience. Um, funnily enough, um, his wife, Uta Frith, is um, one of the absolutely key people, perhaps the key person, arguably behind current um, theories about autism, uh, which are, in a very, very crude nutshell, that um, so-called theory of mind, uh, which seems to be um, a way of interpreting other people's behaviour in terms of um, 
individual agents with different motives and needs, different beliefs, different uh, bodies of knowledge and so forth, or different intentions, um, which arise, which develops in the child from about the age of three uh, and um, doesn't really fully develop for the next few years. Um, that theory of mind, which we've evolved as a social species and without which we just couldn't do the sorts of things that we do, we couldn't have the sort of society we have, um, that involves, as I said, among other things, being able to attribute um, intentions and knowledge and belief and hopes and fears to other people. Now, um, and one suggestion was made uh, in the psychological literature, you know, that suggested the problem with autism and autistic children is that they don't appear to have a theory of mind. They don't appear to develop a theory of mind. And there have been some very, very interesting uh, series of experiments, which Otto Frith, for example, has been involved in very interesting series of experiments, which seem to show that. They're very surprising. And those are, you know, behavioural experiments with kids of different ages and, and seeing how they respond in different situations. Um, well, one of the things that Chris Frith did um, was, in effect, to pick that up and to say, well, look, if that's so, then um, there ought to be a difference um, in the way in which autistic children, and adults, uh, in the way in which autistic people um, process psychological verbs, intentional verbs, as a job and use, but psychological verbs, um, from non-psychological verbs, Sorry, there ought to be a difference between the way in which autistic people process intentional verbs and the way that normal people process intentional verbs. Um, and indeed, this difference ought to be one that suggests that uh, intentional verbs in autistic people are not being processed so well or was not being um, processed in the same sort of way at all. And to cut a very long story short, um, he did some work um, which on the one hand tried to locate the parts of the brain which seem to be active when people are processing psychological verbs um, and then looked at those parts of the brain in autistic people and in non-autistic people and indeed he found that there was the relevant sort of difference. So that's an example. But if the, uh, if the, psych if the psychologists hadn't had that theory about the sorts of processing, the sorts of think thought process, you know, which are going on in the mind, in people who are and people who aren't autistic, he couldn't have asked those neuroscientific questions. I think it's possible in principle, no question, because to say that it isn't possible in principle is in effect to say we do it by magic. No, we don't do it by magic. So in principle it's possible. Uh, whether it's possible in practice, even in a very long time period, is is a very different question because um, I mean yes there have been already enormous and very surprising advances in AI advances that have been surprising not just to the man in the street but to AI professions themselves you know in some cases it's it's um, uh, progressed much more quickly um, than people expected or well, than many people expected but of course, it, this has been only in um, certain sort of individual areas. Uh, and on the one hand, of course, there is the huge problem, which people are perfectly well aware that it's there, the huge problem of integrating all these things in, in one system, which is a, a, a large core. Um, but also uh, taking on board... Um, the areas where there hasn't been such good advance. I mean, even despite the apparent success, and 
to a certain extent, the real success of the Watson program, for instance, you know, which um, which beat human beings in the Jeopardy game, and which looks certainly very very impressive. Uh, I would have um, two, if you like, crit- criticisms of that. I mean, the first is that. Um, Watson in the computer was of course processing hugely quickly and as soon as it thought it had got the answer it could press its button so to speak. Uh, The human beings um, had to actually physically press their button and this takes time and we know you know from the history of astronomy in the late 19th century people that talked about the personal equation Um, you know somebody was uh, sacked from the um, Royal Astronomical Laboratory in England because he wasn't um, picking up changes in the uh, in the sky, uh, in the night sky, as quickly as um, somebody else. Anyway, it turned out um, that it wasn't his fault. He wasn't being lazy. It was just that uh, his physiology was different. He just could not do it, just quite as quickly as you know somebody else could do it. And since then, a lot of work's been done on that sort of thing. So the the apparent success of Watson is partly due to the fact that he's getting rid of that. You know, the computer just doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, But also, um, what Jeopardy does, basically, is sort of making associations between... um, between items of data that has already been fed with. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that there's cheating going on here. I'm not suggesting it's fed with um, just the right sorts of items it's going to need. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but it does have a finite stock of, of, of data, although large, a large stock of data. And, um, and it, can't, it can't sort of see the point of an association. And, for example... Um, if you take a particular image in uh, poetry, for instance, or a, like, give an example I mentioned yesterday in my talk, um, when Shakespeare has Macbeth feeling terribly guilty, cannot sleep because he's so guilty about um, you know having murdered Banquo, um, and he's complaining about lack of sleep, and he compares sleep uh, to somebody knitting up a raveled sleeve. Um, so, and he gives a number of other images in the next few lines, all of which, in hugely creative and surprising ways, pick on the fact about sleep that it refreshes you, that it gives you back strength, um, that it is a restorative. And that at this point, he desperately needs it, right? Now, um, I doubt very much whether that aspect of what's going on here in that sort of three or four lines of that speech could be picked up by Jeopardy, uh, by Watson, for example. And if you're going to have um, a general intelligence, you know, the people who are talking about this, I would say, well, they would need to be able to do sort of that sort of thing. I mean, at least as well as we can. If you're talking about a superhuman intelligence, that's something else going. Let's just talk about a human level intelligence. Um, if it cannot cope with the richness and subtlety of human language and human thinking uh, expressed in language, um, then it's not going to be a human level intelligence. Now, somebody might say, I mean, somebody just said to me uh, this morning, we were talking about this, he said, well, you know, it doesn't have to be um, exactly the same, doesn't have to understand Shakespeare, it might understand something completely different, just like um, there are aspects of a, a Labrador's mind, um, which probably I can't understand, uh, just as the Labrador admittedly can't understand a great deal of, you know, what I do. Um, <laughs> Well, I suppose that might be true, but if it's if it's as alien as that, that it cannot even um, get the sense of um, poetic imagery in the in the way that we can, to the extent that we can, then I don't really know why we would want to call it a human level intelligence. Now, I mean, you might say to that, well. 
um, if it's able to come up with um, new scientific experiments, new scientific theories, and new mathematical problems, and it's able to put those into practice or leave us to put them into practice and they work, that shows that it's intelligent. Well, you know, maybe, but um, uh, in the case of scientific hypotheses, it's relatively easy, relatively, to see whether or not they work or not, okay, whether they're true. Um, but in a case like the one I gave you of uh, understanding poetry, um, and this is not this is not poetry which is difficult to understand. It is, I think, quite exceptionally uh, imaginative. I mean, I, you know, those four lines—they I mean, are quite extraordinary in my view. But they're not an example of what I call difficult poetry. If you go to difficult poetry. Uh, to get the thing to appreciate that, uh, you know, would be um, even more of a challenge, and even more difficult, of course, for actual human beings, which is why I call it difficult poetry. Um, and I don't think it's good enough to say, well, you know, it would be different intelligent from ours, and if it can't understand uh, human language, you know, to the degree that, that we can, well, so what? I don't think that that's good enough, because language is so important in human intelligence that I don't really understand what a human level intelligence, is that a human level intelligence would be, that cannot cope with language to the degree that we can. Well, take the example we were just talking about. That would amaze me. If somebody could do that, I would be very impressed and very interested. But I would say, don't hold your breath.